Greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're very excited to, to spend a little time with you today. Uh, I'm Dave Yeski, and I am joined by Yusuf Abujaderi and Lauren Stansel, uh, two of the senior financial planners and partners of our firm, Yeski Bui. And uh, I want to start out by saying that uh, while we have a lot to share, as is always the case, we're also very, very interested in making this interactive. So, you know, we're hoping you have questions or if you, or if you have questions come up, um, please use the chat box or the question function to, uh, to send us those questions because we'd love to address them and send them as they occur to you and we'll address them as either in real time or make sure we scoop them up at the end, either way. Um, and so before we get started, with our discussion of uh, the, the past year, what's going on in the present and our expectations for the future. I just wanted to allow uh, my co-founder, Elisa Bowie, to come say hi. Hi, everyone. Um, I welcome, and it's nice to see you. Um, I've been listening to this uh, webinar be put together over the past several weeks, and uh, I am looking forward to it as much as I hope you are too. So welcome, and uh, we look forward to hearing what these brilliant people have to say, and I hope that you and yours are um, peaceful and healthy. Thank you. Well, with that, um, take it away, Yusuf. All right, thank you, Dave. So what we'll be doing today is covering a bit of a three-part review. Uh, we'll look back, uh, see what, what things happened over the past year. We'll be talking about economic information, um, things that transpired in the financial markets. Then we'll transition to talking about where we are. Um, we'll do a bit of a discussion about how we responded, um, specifically to how we were managing portfolios, um, how we responded to the COVID crisis and the fallout in financial markets over the past year, um, answering some questions that we've been getting from clients over the past year about dividends and capital gains distributions, and then we'll spend the last segment of today's conversation uh, looking forward. Uh, we've got a few fun things to talk about uh, in that section. But first, uh, talking about the shock to the system uh, that we all experienced and are living through. Um, as we've said in prior webinars, the recession that was brought on by the COVID crisis was a medical recession. Um, and just to use some you know, broad stroke numbers here to paint the picture, the shock was massive. 32 million cases in the US, 141 million cases globally, uh, more than half a million dead in the US and 3 million deaths globally. Uh, those numbers are quantifiable. The impact of those losses, immeasurable. Uh, but in terms of what we'll be talking about with respect to this part of our presentation, um, the economic data that we'll be looking at, those pieces are measurable. And so when the pandemic started, economic activity ground to a halt in an unprecedented fashion uh, quickly. 23 million jobs gone. Almost, I won't say overnight, um, but you can see here in the chart at the top left, uh, the peak number, 153 million employed uh, as of February 2020. By April, that number had dipped by 23 million. As a consequence of which, the unemployment rate quadrupled and then some uh, from a low of 3.5% um, to the peak of 14.8% uh, in April. Relatedly, claims for unemployment insurance benefits spiked. Um, about a quarter million claims there in the, the week of March 14th of 2020. Three weeks later, that number had exploded to more than 6 million. And as you might expect, as a result of all of that, in one quarter's time, gross domestic product or the measure of all economic output down by 10%, uh, more than $2 trillion of economic output gone. And so to continue this conversation, uh, we'll kick it over to Lauren, who's going to tell us a bit about how our leaders, uh, governments and central banks responded. 
Yeah, so as we've been saying, really, since it was all happening, the Fed showed up big and they showed up early. And here are some of the things that the Federal Reserve did directly in response to all of the really scary times we were seeing back in, in March of last year. Um, they pretty much immediately dropped the Fed funds rate to 0% and engaged in massive quantitative easing or bond buying, which, as you know, we saw a lot of in the 2008-2009 Great Recession. Um, speaking of the Great Recession, they also reinvigorated a lot of the crisis programs for lending and support of businesses and governments. And they started some new lending programs, um, specifically the Main Street Lending Program. And this was really for businesses that were too large for the Paycheck Protection Program loans, but too small for their other credit programs. They engaged in a lot of direct financing for state and local governments, support for those governments that were really struggling in the moment. And financing of fallen angels, which are bonds that have fallen to junk status because of the issuers, because the issuer is having problems and having those same struggles and collateralized loan obligations. You know, and I just have to jump in and say one of the things that really impressed me was the way in which uh, the chair of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, Jay Powell, um, he showed up like a hero. He was the one who set the tone for the Fed. And I remember in an interview early, early last year, shortly after things fell apart, um, in response to some question, uh, Chairman Powell said something like, well, you know, it's not like a limited pot. And we have a whole, we have a whole presentation we did on, on monetary theory in the age of coronavirus, uh, which you can reference if you want to see the details. But the fact is, it's not a limited pot. The Fed has great power and Jay Powell Chairman Powell made it clear from day one that, that the Fed was going to step in and use that to whatever degree was necessary to rescue the economy. And then the government showed up big, and we have some really big fiscal support and stimulus programs that came out in 2020 specifically. Uh, speaking of what Dave mentioned, you know, we uh, webinar we did in January, we went into a lot of detail about these programs, and we're always happy to share more. But the first one was the CARES Act, and it was a $2.2 trillion stimulus bill passed in March 2020. And this one really was referred to as stimulus, but we've referred to it as life support, um, really making sure, giving life support to the economy to keep things alive. So this is when required minimum distributions were eliminated for 2020. The first stimulus checks came out, $1,200 per person subject to specific income limitations. We saw the start of the Paycheck Protection Program or the PPP, Economic Injury Disaster Loans, the EIDL, and then very uh, extended unemployment assistance. So you have pandemic unemployment assistance, which was assistance to self-employed individuals who wouldn't otherwise qualify under traditional unemployment benefits. And those unemployment benefits were extended to both types, traditional and the PUA. Um, and expanded charitable deductions. And then later in 2020, December of 2020, we had the Consolidated Appropriations Act. So another $2.3 trillion stimulus bill. Um, 900 billion of that went to stimulus and 1.4 trillion went to fiscal spending. And so we had another round of stimulus checks there. The PPP was reopened uh, for those who had applied and already spent their money and for those who had not yet applied. And we had those unemployment benefits extended yet again for both traditional and pandemic unemployment assistance benefits. And I think it's worth mentioning, there was a question about whether the Fed acted uh, independently or by, was prompted by Congress. Um, the Fed is, does operate independently of Congress, although Congress has oversight. And in this case, the Federal Reserve stepped in on its own independently taking the, those extraordinary actions. Uh, and then Congress stepped in uh, on its own and, and took actions that were honestly equally extraordinary based on all, you know, based on all history, basically. Sorry, Lauren, go on. No, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you answering that. And so what we're showing you here is this is as of December 2020, looking at the almost $5 trillion of fiscal support that had been approved and how much had since been spent. And about $1 trillion of it as of December was left unspent. And a, a large portion of that was due to that December relief bill. So the Consolidated Appropriations Act had just been passed. So that was in the works of being spent. Uh, a lot of the funds that were not yet committed or dispersed were funds that had been set aside for those economic injury disaster loans that hadn't yet been claimed. So additional funds available there. And the ones that are paying out over time are increases to Medicare and health insurance support. 
uh, that pay out over time. And the piece that shows us missing data is just information that we know where the money was directed, but those groups aren't tracking what they have spent so far. And so almost a trillion dollars of that money was left unspent as of December, 2020. And so we'll get into it a little bit later on what that looks like now with additional stimulus that's come down the line. And the big question on everyone's mind, what this all looks like for inflation. Thank you, Lauren. And so as a result in part of all of that stimulus or better term probably being life support. What have we seen since the worst parts uh, in terms of economic data of this pandemic? Jobs have come back. We haven't gotten back all 23 million jobs that uh, were lost, but 14 million, uh, bad, roughly more than half. The unemployment rate is down significantly um, by more than 60% all the way to 6%, not quite yet back to where we uh, were prior to the pandemic, but tremendous progress nonetheless. And initial claims for unemployment insurance, well below, down by 90% uh, from the peak, um, still at twice the rate they were pre-pandemic, um, but 90% decrease, nothing to sneeze at. Um, and if you'll recall, in the early parts of, of the recovery, everyone wanted to guess what shape uh, the recovery would take. Uh, it took a couple quarters, but the fourth quarter numbers for GDP, uh, 21 and a half trillion, just a shade below the $21.6 trillion number uh, in the first quarter of 2020. Um, so if we wanted to venture and say the recovery has thus far uh, been V-shaped, I think that would be a fair claim. So tremendous action on the part of our leaders, uh, central banks and the federal government. And we're seeing how things played out in the economy in part as a result uh, in response to those measures taken. And as we've said, this was a medical, um, a medical recession. And when we look at the medical numbers, I mean, things just this year have improved dramatically. New cases were up at 157,000 per day. Uh, in January of this year, as of this past week, that number is down to 57,000. So very encouraged to see that the new case numbers have uh, been tapering downward. Um, and as of this morning, 212 million vaccines have been administered. Uh, emphasis on this morning, we've been, as you know, working on this webinar for the past couple of weeks. When we started, the number was 190. Uh, very encouraging to see that another 12, 13 million folks have been, uh, 22 million, I should say, uh, folks have been vaccinated uh, while we've been developing these slides. And just looking at the scope uh, of those vaccinations being administered and how uh, quickly the rollout has been uh, unfolding. So here's a world map showing you um, vaccine numbers around the world uh, as of January. And then just in three months, you can see how much more color there is on the map. Uh, darker colored nations showing a higher level uh, of vaccines being administered. All encouraging news, all signs pointing in the right direction. Um, you know, tremendous advancements in the medical and scientific fields have put us in a position where um, more and more people are being vaccinated and that can only mean good things uh, in terms of the ongoing recovery. So Yusuf, before we, yeah. or actually might go along perfectly with your next slide, we did have a question talking about the shape of the recovery you mentioned. And uh, David asked, what is a K-shaped recovery? Yeah, the K-shaped recovery, that letter started to get some play in maybe the third and fourth quarter of last year, just recognizing that we do have some inequality issues uh, within our economy and those issues persist. So while some portions of the economy kind of went through this V shape, imagine that the letter K kind of with this V shape at the top, the, there are parts, you know, members of the economy who may still be really suffering, haven't seen their, uh, their status, their welfare improve um, over the past few quarters or even in recent months. And so that K shape is kind of recognizing that there are different experiences uh, being felt by different members uh, of the economy in our country. That's a really good, well put, Yusuf. And I will just add to that, that 
you know, some of those people are among the still 6% uh, unemployed. Right. And the thing we also need to take into account is that the unemployment rate does not, does not record those who have given up looking for right. <clears throat> a new job. So uh, even beyond that 6%, there, there are probably swaths of the economy, uh, populations within the economy who are suffering more. So, And so everything that we've talked about is, is great context to now address the question of, well, how did all this play out in financial markets? How did it affect our clients' portfolios? So what we're showing you here is a chart of the ACWI, A-C-W-I, All Country World Index, the global index of stocks, uh, over five quarters, 15 months, starting January 2020 through March of this year. Uh, as you may recall, had a bit of a crash in markets last March. Uh, the ACWI was down 30%. Things subsequently rebounded um, over the past year since markets bottomed out on March 23rd of 2020. Uh, we're up 72%. And so interesting to note, if you're down 30%, you have to earn back at least 40% or a bit more to get back to even. <clears throat> and obviously markets have done better than get back to even. The overall increase from the peak last February to uh, the end of March, a 20% increase, which is a great argument for why we're always as, as saying you, stay you know. invested. Um, you know, times were tough. Things were really scary uh, back in March and April of last year. And we kept repeating, um, stay invested, stay patient, stick to your guns. Um, and we've seen over the past year the benefits of exercising that discipline, um, how that's played out in financial markets globally. Uh, and we've seen the effects on our clients' portfolios, which is what we'll look at right now. So this is the first of, of two bar charts that look like this that we'll be showing you as a part of today's discussion. Um, this particular chart spans the exact same time frame uh, as the prior chart, the prior slide that we were looking at. Um, when you look at the different components of our clients' portfolios over the past 15 months, what we're gratified to see is that the best performers were small and value stocks, specifically in the US. Uh, as our clients know, one of the decisions that we make with respect to how we manage their portfolios uh, is that we're heavy on small company stocks and heavy on value stocks. And so even in spite of um, the downswing in the early part of last year and throughout the recovery, what we've seen is that nothing has done better than small company value stocks in the US. Um, our broader fund that captures small company activity, um, not just focusing on value, also done extremely well. Um, and then in third place is the S&P 500. And just to contextualize the performance that you're seeing of the S&P uh, at better than 23%, with the two small company funds being north of 30, the performance in the S&P is skewed because there are a few companies you may have heard of, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Netflix gets thrown in there. Sometimes Tesla is mentioned as well. Massive companies uh, that skew those returns in their favor. Um, what's been dubbed as the FAMA 5, uh, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, and, and Google, Alphabet being the parent company, over these five quarters, they're up 43%. The remainder of the stocks in the S&P still up, uh, but those 495 stocks are only up only 18%. And so it's just interesting to see how the performance of a few gigantic companies uh, can skew performance for an entire index. Uh, and then you can see the rest of the, the holdings in our clients' portfolios below the S&P. We'll talk a bit about how the rank order of some of these uh, different components of the portfolio has been changing uh, in recent months. Uh, and those are trends that we're encouraged by uh, and happy to see as, uh, as the months roll out in this recovery. So that concludes the first portion of today's discussion. And now we'll transition into uh, kind of the section where we wanna talk about where we are. Um, so we'll be focusing mainly on two topics, um, rebalancing, trading, things that we're doing with respect to managing our clients' portfolios, 
Uh, and then a, com a couple comments about dividends and capital gains distributions. We'll look back at 2020, um, talk about why those distributions may have been different from what you might have expected. Uh, and then the outlook for 2021, uh, talk about how things may be different this year uh, than they were last year. So with respect to rebalancing, first, let's look back. As we said, things were bad last March. And just to contextualize how dramatic the crash was, it took 16 trading days, or a little bit more than three weeks, for markets to enter a bear market, or what's known, uh, what's you know, defined as 20% uh, below a previous peak. It's the fastest drop to a bear market in history. But it wasn't all bad every day. Case in point, March 12th was the second worst day of the year. The S&P, to pick uh, an index just to kind of represent how bad things were, the S&P was down 9.5% in one day. It's a bad day. Um, March 13th, the immediate next trading day, the S&P was up 9.3%, which was the second best trading day of the year. And so we'll talk a bit about how we change our process uh, our normal rebalancing approach in response to volatility like that. Um, but zooming out a bit, when everything dived downward, the thing that we did was look for opportunities to rebalance. And when stocks are taking a dive like that, the thing that you want to do is look for chances to buy stocks because they're priced now relatively cheaply uh, to what they were priced at in, in recent weeks and days. The thing that we were selling was the only thing that hadn't moved upward or downward, bonds. And so across all of our clients' accounts, we were looking for opportunities to sell bonds, buy stocks on the cheap, uh, and live out the phrase, buy low and hopefully sell high. Um, and the word hopefully is actually unnecessary. We're actually doing the selling high right now. Uh, so the inverse of the trade that I just described, uh, what we've been doing in 2021, you know, recall the chart just a couple of slides ago, as we saw everything recovered and then has exceeded previous peaks. Uh, you've no doubt heard the headlines on the news. Record high for the S&P 500, record high for the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Um, we've seen those, those uh, outcomes play out in our clients' portfolios, and we're now actually selling stocks and buying bonds up um, to rebalance the portfolio. We'll talk about the implications uh, of those trades here in just a moment. Um, but first, I want to spend a minute kind of refreshing uh, our clients' memories or maybe showing, uh, for those of you who haven't seen before, what our rebalancing process looks like and how we know when it's time uh, to buy or sell different investments in our clients' portfolios. So our normal process, um, and, and the chart here is showing you, you know, gradual increases and decreases in values. Um, it's a four-year period illustrated on the chart. Um, imagine a portfolio with four investments in it, each one starting with a target weight of 25%. We put a tolerance band of 20% on each component of the portfolio. So that means that this 25% target, uh, if the investment grows to 30%, it's a 5% increment, that increase above 25% would then breach that 20% threshold. Once we see a component breach, we sell and bring things back down to target. The inverse is true. Uh, if something is doing poorly uh, relative to other pieces of the portfolio, once it crosses this lower threshold here, we'll look for opportunities to top it back up. So what was happening back in March of 2020? All the stocks, we're doing this uh, and the bonds were sitting flat. And so we were selling bonds and buying those stocks back up uh, to their target. A point here, just about how volatile things were. Six of the best, or I should say six of the most volatile trading days in the past 50 years occurred in a three or four week stretch last spring. Um, there were some great days on the far left here. You can see uh, April 6th, March 13th and 24th, up 7% or more on a couple of days up by more than 9%. Um, in the middle of March, however, uh, the numbers were pretty gruesome. 
um, double digit decline uh, on March 16th, second worst trading day in the past 50 years, um, bested only by Black Monday uh, back in the, in the late 80s. Uh, and then you can see some of the other dates here. I mentioned that our normal process is to look every two weeks for those kinds of rebalancing opportunities as uh, depicted on the previous chart. In times that are this volatile, times where the S&P 500, for example, was moving 5% plus or minus every day for two weeks straight, we're looking for rebalancing opportunities every day. Um, so in a sense, the way that we responded to the COVID crisis and what was happening in markets is we took our process and adjusted it for what was happening out in the real world and made sure that we weren't losing any opportunities to take advantage of what markets uh, were providing. With respect to rebalancing, a final comment there before I open it up to Dave and Lauren for any additional comments or we move on to the next part of this segment. Now that we're doing the inverse trade of the rebalancing trades that we were doing um, last spring and we're selling stocks that have been up uh, over the past year, we're doing so as efficiently as possible. Uh, we're selling investments that you've held in all likelihood for a year or more so that you're taxed at the most preferred rates. And yet we are going to be gener generating some realized gains. Um, it's you know, part, of, part of the deal when the portfolio is up, uh, rebalancing can sometimes mean uh, realized gains. And that's a good thing. Um, if, if this is the kind of trade that we're able to execute at this point in the recovery, it means the portfolio has done well. Uh, in spite of what's been happening in financial markets. I guess I'll just jump in and add one thing, and that is that um, <clears throat> for those of our clients who are operating under our safe spending system, um, the rebalancing can be a little different. We still rebalance between different categories of stocks as they, as they rise and fall, but the bonds represent a stable reserve of value uh, that we use to meet your spending needs during these kind of volatile times that we saw early in, in 2020. So in that case, we don't sell bonds and buy stocks during a downturn. We preserve that bond allocation as a bridge to, to meet your spending needs until the stock market is recovered. So, and we'll say, we, I think we may even say more about that later. I can't remember. Uh, but we, we switched to... Um, only living off of bonds, living off of bonds, if you will, last February. And then we reversed, so we do normal rebalancing again now. Um, but during, it's, it's, so it's during a major downturn that the rebalance between stocks and bonds shifts and we preserve those bonds to meet your spending needs. Yeah, thanks for that insight, Dave. Moving on to a couple topics that a couple items, kind of one topic that a lot of clients were asking us about in 2020, um, dividends and capital gains distributions. So as you may have noticed um, in working on your tax returns this year, the dividend and capital gains distribution income from the portfolio was way down in 2020. So we're gonna talk a little bit about why that was the case and how that might be different in 2021. Uh, but first, what's a dividend? Uh, it's a distribution of a share of a company's earnings to its shareholders. Uh, it can be in the form of cash uh, or reinvested shares. We always opt for our clients to receive their dividends in the form of cash. Uh, it helps us rebalance more efficiently because there's cash coming into the portfolio without us having to sell something. Um, <clears throat> as you might expect, a number of companies cut or reduced their dividends last year or didn't pay a dividend at all. Uh, and therefore, the dividends from the mutual funds that our clients own, which just capture activity of individual companies around the world, were also down significantly. And, and it's one thing, it's worth noting that, um, first of all, value stocks in general tend to have a higher dividend payout rate um, than the rest of the stock market. And so when a, when a portfolio is tilted towards value stocks, uh, it's tilted towards a somewhat higher rate of dividends to begin with, which means if companies start cutting dividends, you notice it more in a, in a value-focused portfolio. And in some cases, I will say like with financials, which were in the, the value category, uh, in the European Union, most of those governments actually legally mandated that those companies cut their dividend during the crisis. 
And likewise, with respect to capital gains distributions, those were also down. Um, and so what's a capital gains distribution? With respect to the activity that occurs within a mutual fund, oftentimes when markets are down, lots of investors are selling their shares. When that happens, the mutual fund companies are forced to realize gains within the fund uh, so that they can distribute the proceeds out to the investors who are liquidating their positions. Um, if any gains are realized, the remaining shareholders receive their cut of those gains in the form of capital gains distributions. Why we're both down in 2020, we talked about dividends. On the capital gains distributions, because the crash occurred so early on in the year, the portfolio managers of the mutual funds that we own in our clients' uh, accounts purposely worked to take advantage of the downswing in markets to keep those distributions low. Because the last thing that you want to see in a tough returns year is a lot of taxable income from the portfolio. So you get this double whammy of performance being bad um, and then high taxes on top of that. Uh, it's kind of like uh, pouring salt in the wound. So it's not a bad thing to see dividends and capital gains distribution down. It just means that taxable income from the portfolio uh, was less than we expected. And yet it has no negative impact on the overall total return of the portfolio. The shares of the investments in the portfolio continue to appreciate. Um, and therefore all the returns were still realized. Uh, the, the price appreciation was still felt uh, by all, the, uh, all of our clients' accounts. As things recover, however, it's unlikely that we'll see those dividends and capital gains distributions numbers be as low in 2021. In fact, I think a more appropriate expectation would be to see things revert back to 2019 levels. Um, so as we're going through our cycle of reviews of all of our clients' tax situations throughout the year, um, you know, we'll be reflecting uh, different information and not using 2020 as a proxy um, for our forward going projections or forward looking projections, I should say. And so on to the final segment of our presentation here, uh, looking forward, where could we be headed? Uh, might we be seeing some trends uh, in financial markets to give us cause to think that it's time to party like it's 1999? Uh, we'll talk a bit about what that even means. Um, we'll have some comments about inflation and comments, uh, more comments about uh, fiscal policy decisions um, and what you might expect in terms of uh, other policy decisions as the year unfolds. But first, a couple comments about the deep regularities that we observe in markets um, historically and, and the things that we look at uh, to guide us in making decisions about how we allocate our clients' investments. Um, the deep regularities that we've observed over the past many decades, pers persistent phenomena, that value stocks tend to outperform growth stocks, small company stocks tend to outperform large company stocks, and the bottom bullet there, it's not that international companies tend to outperform U.S. companies forever or always, but that there's a change in leadership back and forth between the two. And we're highlighting these deep regularities because it's often that when we see the economic cycle rebooted, when we see financial markets rebooted, as we've seen in response to the COVID crisis, oftentimes we see these phenomena rear their head uh, in the ways that the portfolio performs. And so we'll look at a couple more charts here to, to set the context and then take a look at how the portfolio performed the last time uh, circumstances look like they do now. Uh, and then we'll take a peek at how the portfolio has been doing in recent months. So this is a, I think it's a beautiful chart. Others might look at it and say that uh, it's kind of weird looking. What you're seeing is the spread between the performance of small value stocks relative to large growth stocks. So the two premiums that we're seeking to capitalize upon in the portfolio, the outperformance of small company stocks and the outperformance of value stocks, you're seeing that illustrated on this chart. It's a rolling three-year return, or it's a depiction of rolling three-year returns uh, over the past almost 100 years. When the line is above 0%, 
what that's saying is that small and value stocks are doing better than large growth stocks. We're always happy when that's the case. What's been challenging over the past couple of years is that those small and value stocks haven't been doing as well as the large growth stocks. Now, don't take this line down here as an indication that the returns were negative for small and value. It's just that relative to large and growth stocks, they weren't doing quite as well. So the difference is negative. The last time we saw this line dip this far below uh, that 0% figure, or the 0% line, I should say, was back in 99. And then what happened? Things shot up as the dot-com meltdown started to unfold. Uh, small company stocks did much better than large company stocks over the subsequent three, four years. Um, and, uh, and that was the case with value stocks as well. Dave, you're muted if there was if you were jumping in there. Sorry, I was just saying it seems like that next slide illustrates well what you're talking about. Yeah, and so we've zoomed in um, on this period that we're most interested in looking at. And, There's and that. I, I, I'm going to jump in because I live through it. And I have this very visceral feelings about this. You know, you see this 98, 99 period on the left there. And <clears throat> that what that's indicating is that through the, through the latter half of the 90s, uh, it was a very go-go period for technology stocks, for big growth stocks, Intel and Cisco and all the rest. And, <clears throat> you know, we were managing portfolios the same way then as we are now. We had a tilt towards uh, value stocks. We had a tilt towards small company stocks. Uh, and they were lagging those, those go-go tech stocks, which sort of had eaten up a, a large share of the S&P 500 the way they did in recent years. So for the last couple of years, I've been saying to anyone who will listen, it's really feeling like the late 90s. It's really feeling like 1999 again. Um, but of course, nothing lasts forever. These, these differences can be like a stretched rubber band. You don't know when it's going to reverse, but sooner or later it does. So I'll let you go on, Yusuf. Well, just looking back, you know, how did, how did these circumstances end up playing out uh, with our portfolios back in the late 90s? Um, we included the year ending 1997 just to show uh, a year in which we had outperformed our benchmark. And then when you look at 98 and 99, we were a little bit behind. Uh, and that's because although we own large company stocks, we own growth stocks in the portfolio. Um, we didn't have, or sorry, we were more skewed towards those small company and value stocks. And then when things kind of popped in terms of the dot-com meltdown with those go-go tech stocks, Dave, as you were talking about, what started to lead financial markets in terms of performance? Small company stocks, value stocks. Um, you know, those go-go tech stocks, by and large, most of them were U.S. companies. Um, international companies came to the fore uh, in the subsequent years. And so just to highlight a couple things that we observed, first of all, um, our performance in, two, in the year ending 1231-2000 we were ahead of the benchmark by 22% or more. Um, in the subsequent years, ahead of the benchmark by a full 4%. The explanation behind uh, that outperformance for all those years um, following 1999, value was beating growth within the large company segment of the portfolio by 9% per year. 4% um, per year on the small company side for, for domestic stocks. Uh, and small companies were outperforming large company stocks uh, by almost 13% per year. We saw the same trends internationally um, and international companies were outperforming US companies, slightly different time period um, from 02 to 07, on average by 10% per year. And so we just saw that leadership switch um, as things were rebooted when the, uh, the market was crashing as a result of the dot-com meltdown. Yusuf, can you, can you go back one slide? Yeah. So we had a question about uh, why the line is down when we also showed a chart earlier that small company stocks are doing better than large company stocks. And it's a great question. I had the same question, honestly. And I'll, uh, although Yusuf answered it for me, I'll answer it for you. Um, the small company and small value stocks have been doing better than large and large growth stocks since January 1 of last year, based on that earlier chart we showed. This chart actually shows a three-year rolling uh, average difference. And so 
the period during which the small company and small value have been doing better is a year and a quarter. Uh, and this is a three year rolling. So, you know, see us again in a few months or in the next six months and, and we may see the reversal of that. Yeah, and it's great to point out that that, end, that three year rolling average is ending um, as of June, 2020. Um, it's not quite direct overlap with some of the, the timeframes we're gonna be looking at here, but it's appropriate. If we look at trends since markets bottomed out in March, 2020, um, small company stocks as measured by performance of the Russell 2000 index relative to the NASDAQ index, which tracks tech company stocks. Small company stocks have outperformed by almost 22%. Um, likewise, small company stocks have been outperforming large company stocks over the past year uh, by almost 40%. Um, and when you look at small value versus large growth, so going back to that chart that we've uh, looked at a couple of times, small and value have been outperforming large growth by almost 50% uh, over the past year. So seeing those premiums that we're seeking to capitalize upon um, really coming to the fore here in the past year. And in the past six months, we promised you this bar chart once again, here it is. Um, so looking at the Yeski buoy portfolio's performance um, over the past six months, at the top, again, U.S. small value and U.S. small, just behind them, uh, U.S. large value. So always happy to see components of the portfolio with the words small value or both uh, at the top of the chart here. And then here's the other trend that we're seeing over the past six months. That's just interesting. Um, you know, we're, we have a globally diversified portfolio. We don't overweight or underweight any one country's uh, presence um, in our stock portfolio. And yet you can see the S&P 500, uh, again, skewed because of the performance of those massive tech companies dropping uh, towards almost the bottom of, uh, of the ranking here with all the international funds um, coming ahead and the value funds internationally outperforming uh, their broader counterparts. So trends that we're excited about, trends that we're encouraged by, um, and trends that give us a reason to feel like history, if not repeating itself, uh, is at least rhyming. Uh, and that's, you know, hearkening back to the quote attributed to Mark Twain. Um, you know, these deep regularities, they, they pop up in ways that aren't necessarily identical every economic cycle, uh, but in ways that might be familiar uh, as things continue on. And so with that, um, before we look at some additional economic information in terms of inflation, we'll kick it back to Lauren to talk more uh, about fiscal support measures that have been taken um, in the past years and months. And Yusuf, before we jump into that, I'm going to direct yeah. it actually back to you and Dave. We got a good question from Jim. We seem to be in a period of sustained economic growth post-Trump. Those of us who are drawing down RMDs, required minimum distributions from our IRAs, how can we protect against a burst in the bubble? I'm gonna jump in and just say one thing that I think is really important to note. And that is that I mentioned earlier that for those spending clients like you, Jim, um, the, uh, during a cyclical downturn in the stock market, we stop selling stocks to rebalance. We never, or, or, or we, I should say, we stop selling stocks for any reason. We don't sell stocks to meet your spending needs because we want to give them a chance to recover. So you live off that stable bond reserve to bridge you through that downturn. Uh, as you pointed out, we've had very strong returns since, uh, actually since the beginning of last, last year, but especially since the, 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 you know, sort of the worst of the recession. And we're, we're well into the, into the positive territory again. As Yusuf noted earlier, we've switched from selling, selling bonds and buying stocks to selling stocks and buying bonds. And even for those of you who are in a retirement portfolio or a spending portfolio, um, we are now back because stocks are back into positive territory. We're now, we're now actually harvesting some of those gains and moving them back to that stable reserve. So we are replenishing the stable reserve. And if we have another reversal that, you know, whether it's in, in six months or six years or whenever, uh, we know there will be another one, we just don't know when, but uh, we will have spent time actually taking profits off the table and adding them back to your stable reserve. So we're, whenever, whenever we have a nice recovery like this, we, the, our first order of business is to replenish that stable reserve so it's there for you the next time you need it. 
Jim said, thanks. That's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> Perfect. On to you, Lauren. All right. So, so we've talked a lot about what has happened, especially in the stock market and use of shared in the economy. And the stock market and the economy are certainly related, but different things. And the economy is still in need of support. And so the government has shown up again big in 2021 with additional fiscal support to the tune of another $2 trillion on top of the almost $5 trillion uh, approved and, and distributed in 2020. So we had the American Rescue Plan in March 2021, and this was President Biden's first big piece of legislation. We had another round of stimulus checks, this time $1,400 per person. The unemployment assistance we've been talking about was yet again extended through the end of September this year. There are some increased tax credits available. Uh, those include the child, or child and dependent care tax credit, the child tax credit, and the earned income tax credit. Uh, this plan also supplied a lot of money for COVID testing and vaccine support to make sure that every American could get their vaccine for free and continue to get testing as needed. Uh, it also extended a 15% increase in food stamps for those really in need of support and increased some emergency paid leave for those who are in support roles and needed to be taking time to take care of loved ones. And if we go to the next slide, as we shared earlier, not all of the fiscal support has been spent from 2020. And with this new bill just last month in 2021, there's quite a bit of money that in this fiscal support realm that has not yet actually been injected into the economy in these various ways that the spending is planning, being planned to take place. And so this graph here, you can see that there are some, there are three different uh, response areas that have been tracked, administrative actions, legislative actions, and federal, federal reserve actions. And there's quite a bit on the right-hand side of each one of those graphs that is yet to be spent. And so as you would imagine, as I'm sure is on all of your minds and as is in the headlines, a lot of people are concerned, what does this mean for inflation? And Dave, I, I don't know about you, but there was no economic model that I studied in graduate school that would have possibly illustrated this many trillions of dollars being spent without you know, the outcome being that inflation would be running rampant. And yet here we are, uh, the trailing 12 month uh, measure of inflation at 2.6%, just a bit above uh, the Fed's target of 2%. Um, a full percentage point, just about uh, higher than the previous 12 month measure uh, that came out in February, 1.7%. Um, and Lauren, you alluded to it on your previous slide. Not all of those trillions that have been marked as spent have been spent. Um, but you know, the question, the question has to be asked, how is it that we're not yet seeing it? Um, I'll make a couple of comments and then I'll kick it to you, Dave, uh, for your insights. You know, as we mentioned on previous slides, there's still work to be done in terms of getting jobs back and some 9 million jobs have yet to be recovered. Um, you know, until we get to full employment, um, there's no inflationary pressure on wages um, or certainly not any that might be you know, over to cause inflation overall. Uh, we're not quite there yet. And in terms of other dollars not being spent, you know, zooming in on the consumer, uh, just in 2020, Americans saved one and a half trillion dollars. Um, and that is in addition to what was being described as a global savings glut um, coming into 2020. And so although there has been a lot of money spent by the government and um, other institutions, other agencies, there is still spending to be done uh, and still work to be done to get the economy back uh, to the level that it was at prior to uh, the pandemic. Uh, so that's part of the explanation. Um, Dave, what and would I'll you just add say, to I'll that? just jump in and say uh, something more about the global savings glut is, is, you know, beyond the, you know, we all read about the, the, the uh, support checks um, being used to pay down debt or saved, but beyond that, and for many years, for many years running now, we've had an aging global population. There's a demographic thing that is like, in, I'm going to say relatively immutable. The global population is aging. And as people age, they tend to save more. And so we, that's, that's created the so-called savings glut because not only do people save more and spend less as they age, they tend to invest in, in uh, low-risk assets. And so 
that savings glut globally, because you know, driven by this de- this this fundamental demographic trend, um, has resulted in there being a huge demand worldwide for safe investments like bonds. And so when when all of this money is being used to buy bonds, it drives up the price of bonds. And when the price of a bond goes up, the interest rate or the yield goes down. And so that's one of the things that's kept interest rates low. And when interest rates are low, that tends to have a downward pressure on inflation as well. Sorry, Yusuf, I... No, no, that was perfect. Um, And I don't know that there's much to add, although I'll I'll make a comment about supply chains just because the Suez Canal blockage was in headlines um, for the better part of a couple of weeks. So, you know, over the past decades, we've shifted to a globalized economic system. And one of the things that tamps inflation down is the fact that local producers are not dependent on local markets to make goods. If a producer somewhere, um, you know, is running up against a cost, or excuse me, a factor of production uh, that is more expensive, you can outsource and look for that factor elsewhere more cheaply. And so because inflationary pressures don't crop up in a uniform manner uh, in every corner of the global market, um, producers are still able to, to look for, for substitutes elsewhere um, and more cheaply. And because they can do that, that helps um, with keeping inflation down as well. And so enough about inflation, unless we get questions. Um, Lauren, going back to you uh, to talk more about policy decisions and, and what we can expect uh, going forward. Great. So the big one on everyone's radar right now is the American Jobs Plan. And this is President Biden's infrastructure plan that is in discussions now. And I'll start with a caveat that it will probably say multiple times, nothing has been passed here. Uh, What has been proposed by the Biden administration is very unlikely to pass in its current form. So there are a lot of discussions going on. So we'll share what we know so far. And as always, we will keep tabs on this and be sure we're updating you as things change if action needs to be taken. So the infrastructure plan really focuses on some key points of American infrastructure, including fixing highways, bridges, and transit systems, ensuring clean drinking water and high-speed broadband for all Americans, modernizing the facilities where our country's children learn and grow up, uh, upgrading hospitals and federal buildings, increasing affordable housing for those in need. It's also focused on raising wages for essential home care workers and creating jobs. Uh, Really, a big piece of this is creating jobs, revitalizing manufacturing, and investing in research and development and workforce development for those Americans who will be moving into these jobs. Lauren, is it not true that uh, part of that last part uh, involves a focus on uh, on supporting community colleges where where so many Americans retool themselves when they... Yep, exactly. So that workforce development is going to be a big focus of of training Americans to then be able to take on these jobs that we're hoping to create. And unlike the other legislation we reviewed, Yusuf, if we move to the next slide, this plan is not actually going to be fully funded by government spending and government debt. It's actually going to be funded primarily by tax increases over the coming 15 years or so. And so the first big piece that is has been talked about and is proposed is a corporate tax rate increase. And President Biden has referred to this as the Made in America tax plan. And so the plan here in general, there are of course a lot of details, but the plan is to increase the corporate tax rate from 21% to 28%. And an important note here is President Trump decreased the corporate tax rate to a flat 21%. But before that, the corporate tax rates were a tiered tax system with a maximum tax rate of about 39%. So this increase to 28% is not something we have never seen before. And it's actually something we've seen very recently in corporate tax rates. Uh, And as I said, none of this is set in stone. President Biden has recently said he's willing to negotiate on that rate uh, in order to get really the big pieces of this plan passed through. Another big piece of the corporate tax increase that's been discussed is a minimum tax on book income for all corporations. So book income is what these corporations are reporting to their shareholders as their revenue and as their profits. And so making sure that those corporations are paying at least 15% on those profits they're able to report to their shareholders. 
And similarly for multinational companies who have been offshoring a lot of their income and therefore their taxes and a lot of jobs, there will be some incentives that will be removed in, in, the, in the realm of a global minimum tax to ensure that these companies are paying at least a minimum percentage on all income earned around the world to the various government entities that it belongs to. And the big piece here that is probably of highest interest to most of you on the call and certainly to us in the planning we do is in potential individual income tax increases. So we've heard a lot about if your income is below $400,000, nothing will change. But the plan is that for family income above $400,000, we will revert to the maximum tax rate of 39.6. So again, this is not something that had, we've never seen before. Prior to the 2017 Tax Cut and Jobs Act, the maximum tax rate was 39.6%. And that would apply to family income above $400,000. And to explain that, you can go to the next one, Yusuf, that was actually perfect. <laughs> what I think is really important to know about this proposal and about how tax rates work is if your income is over $400,000, it doesn't mean every dollar you earn is going to be taxed at 39.6%. It means only the income above that $400,000 threshold will then be subject to the 39.6% tax rate. So all of the tax rates underneath of 400,000 will remain the same. So you have tiers, steps and tiers of taxes where you have income tax at 10, 12, 22, 24, and 32%. And right now you then would bump into 35 and then 37. Under this proposal, after 32%, you would bump into that 39.6% tax bracket. And similarly, if we move to the next one, Yusuf, capital gains are another one that have been discussed as being taxed at higher rates for those who earn more than a million dollars a year. And this is very important. It's the same thing. If you, have, if you earn more than a million dollars, only your capital gains above one million dollars will be taxed at this 39.6% rate. So for all capital gains between income of zero and $1 million, you will still be subject to the zero, 15 or 20% preferential rate on those gains. It's only when the income rises above $1 million that those capital gains will begin to be subject to that higher 39.6% rate. That's a combination of that's a combination of other sources of income plus capital gains. Right? Exactly, so capital gains, your ordinary income, which comes from things like your salary and wages or business income, is always the foundation of your taxable income. And then your capital gains sit on top. And so when your total income is then above one million, the capital gains above a million are going to then be subject to that 39.6% rate. And so what can be done? And I will, I will share this caveat again. Nothing has been passed. And what we know right now is likely far from its final form, given the negotiations that will need to be happening in, in government. But if we assume this were to pass as it stands and it were to pass in 2021, we assume that it would be, um, it would be active or effective as of 2022. So the 2022 tax year. And if that were the case. And, and Lauren, there was a question about our expectations about retroactivity. So you might want to address yes, that. Yes, great question. So all of the, our expectations and all of the experts we've been reading from do not expect that this would be made retroactive to 2021. The government and President Biden do have the authority to make that happen, but it's been very rare. I think one time in the last 50 years has one of these major tax overhauls been made retroactive. And so our understanding and expectation and then everything we're reading from the experts is that this would be proactive for the next tax year after it's passed. So whatever year it's passed, the next tax year you can place in here where we show 2022. But the planning that we would be doing, we would be reviewing for our clients, reviewing everything and reaching out proactively if we think action needs to be taken. So with respect to the $400,000 ordinary income tax limit, if clients have tax, taxable income above that $400,000 and have any sort of control over when that income is realized, the consideration or the action to take would be potentially accelerating ordinary income into the current tax year. So this may be possible for self-employed individuals who can bill contracts sooner or, or request payments sooner, sooner or small business owners able to realize income sooner. Similarly, uh, part of our review, if and when this passes and we know what the final rules are going to be, we'll be looking at those with income higher than 1 million. 
And so presumably that income higher than 1 million would include the first piece here. So accelerating ordinary income into this year and also looking to accelerate capital gains. So that may be specifically harvesting gains in your taxable accounts in your portfolio. Sometimes you'll see, you'll get emails from us about harvesting losses in big gain years. In this year, we would be doing the opposite, looking to harvest gains and pay at the current capital gains tax rates, or maybe speed up diversification plans. So if you have an account that has a lot of legacy positions, you inherited it, or we're working to diversify it into our investment philosophy and our portfolio, we would consider accelerating those plans. And similarly, if you have any concentrated stock positions and we're working on plans to diversify out of those over a few years, we would be considering and having a conversation with you about whether it makes sense to accelerate some of those gains into this year at these current lower than proposed capital gains tax rates. And the last piece I'll really spend time focusing on here is ongoing opportunities. So based on the legislation that has actually passed and is law, what can be done? And there are a few things that do continue to apply, a few for just 2021 and a few that are permanent. So one of the changes was for those who do not itemize their deductions, or put another way, for those who take the standard deduction, if you give to charity in cash, you can take an above the line deduction for $300 of cash contributions or $600 if you're married filing jointly. <laughs> Uh, there also is the opportunity to make, for those who do itemize, make cash charitable contributions that you can then deduct up to 100% of your adjusted gross income, essentially wipe out all of your taxable income. Now, this is something we would want to talk about because it's likely not a great plan to use up all of those super low tax brackets. You would want to do it over a few years and take advantage of the highest tax brackets. And those increased tax credits we talked about briefly, your tax preparer and tax professional will certainly apply those if they apply to you, and you'll get the benefit of those higher tax credits for the 2021 tax year. And then when it comes to permanent changes, and permanent is a funny word in the world of tax laws because they change a lot, especially the last few years, but for now, what's permanent? If you, if you itemize your deductions and have medical expenses, your, med your medical expenses above 7.5% of your adjusted gross income are now deductible. And that 7.5% has wavered between 7.5% and 10%, and it has been different by age. It is now 7.5% for everyone. And as we talked about, RMDs have also been delayed. So you now don't have to take your first required minimum distribution from your retirement accounts until the year you turn 72 that was formerly 70 and a half. So it gives us a year and a half extra of doing potential Roth conversions at low tax rates before your required minimum distributions kick in. And qualified charitable distributions are also another big planning opportunity for those who now use the higher standard deduction but do give to charity every year. They're tax-free distributions from your IRA directly to charity that you can still start at 70 and a half, but when you start required minimum distributions, they actually count for that money. So they in, in effect give you a dollar for dollar tax deduction for your charitable giving. I, I have to say when it comes to permanent, um, you know, it reminds me of the fact that when Lauren was starting her graduate program in taxation, the first class she had to take was one on tax research and decision-making because that, Tax code changes so frequently that you have to know how to do research uh, in order to really be able to stay on top of it. Very true. And we did have one more question. Is it safe to assume the 2.8% ACA tax will still exist? I believe that's referring to the 3.8% net investment income tax. That is an additional tax on net investment income. And yes, there, there has been no talk of that going away. So that would be assumed to continue to be a tax that would be paid on those capital gains in addition to either the 15, 20, or 39.6% tax rates under these potential changes. And another great question, has there been any discussion in, on changes to the SALT deduction? So those are the state and local tax deductions that are now limited to $10,000 per married filing jointly couple. So that is your state taxes, state income taxes you used to be able to deduct and property taxes and real estate taxes. That has been discussed as an ideal of something that would like to, we would like to see go away. It hasn't actually been verbally mentioned by the Biden administration, but a lot of those uh, experts in the field and those paying attention think it's something we could see uh, that would come as something could, that could be eliminated in any future tax changes, but it has not yet been discussed. 
Um, and then Jim had a great point for us, an important distinction, qualified charitable distributions. So those distributions from your retirement account directly to charity, those can only be made from your IRA. Those cannot come from a 401k. So that is a great point. Thank you, Jim, for sharing. And there are a couple slides here. I know we're over time, so we'll spend a mere fraction of time on these because these are even less likely. But these are other discussions that have come up in the realm of tax law changes that we may or may not see this year, next year, sometime during President Biden's administration. So right now, the real, the real answer of what to do is nothing. Let us pay attention. If anything comes up, we will contact you. We will let you know if action needs to be taken. But a couple of things that have been talked about, potentially uh, revert, reverting the estate tax exemption levels to the pre-tax cut and jobs act levels. So right now the estate tax exemption is $11.7 million per person. This would revert back to about 6 million per person or 12 million per couple. And it, uh, an important note, this is already planned to happen. Uh, these tax cut and jobs act changes sunset at the end of 2025, but this could happen sooner. And there has also been talk of an elimination of the step up in cost basis at death. Uh, that's another one, you know, we think that's pretty far out there. If that were to happen, it's pretty, it's pretty radical. Um, so right now there's nothing to do, but there would be planning to do if either of those passed. Similarly, there may be some other tax rate increases. There's been discussion of having social security taxes kick back in on income above $400,000, limiting the effectiveness of itemized deductions to a maximum of 28%. So if you're paying a tax rate of 39.6, you only get 28% benefit of your deductions. Uh, eliminating the 20% qualified business income deduction for high earners and potentially increasing the estate tax rate to 45%. And finally, there are some other pieces here. Again, these nothing here has actually come into any sort of proposed bill, just discussions, potential forgiveness on $10,000 of federal student loans, uh, changing, the, changing the traditional versus Roth conversation. So here the maximum benefit of making a traditional retirement contribution would be 26%. It means it would be an equal benefit for everyone making those contributions, which could change the math or the discussion on whether to make Roth or traditional contributions. There has been more talk of further delaying RMDs, required minimum distributions to age 75, and maybe waiving them for retirement accounts under $100,000. And additional tax credits and retirement savings uh, availability for caregivers who are working in really important roles in caregiving in homes. So like I said, nothing to do on those last few slides besides let us pay attention to it. And if and when things do actually change, we'll be sure to be reaching out and keeping you updated. And as Lauren noted, we are um, over time. Uh, but for those of you who are pa can patiently stay with us for just like two or three more minutes, I didn't want to ignore an earlier question about taxes and I'll read it. Oh, pardon me, about inflation. Um, you talked about surprisingly low inflation. Do you expect that to continue? What is your longer term outlook on inflation? Are you making portfolio changes in anticipation of increasing inflation? What role do large growth stocks play? So let me start by saying, uh, and I'm pretty confident Yusuf's in the same place. I have not completely thrown my former academic training out the window. <laughs> um, when you have a lot of a lot of money sloshing around in the system, either because of actions by the Federal Reserve and other central banks uh, or fiscal support provided by the federal government or other national governments. Um, I don't believe it. I believe there are thresholds beyond which it will have uh, an impact. Um, I think that the impact nonetheless will be moderated. So we might see a little more inflation. We might see a tick up to 3%, 3.5%, who knows, maybe 4%. Those of us who have been around as long as I have think that's a pretty low inflation rate still. Um, but the slack persists. You know, we have a 6% unemployment rate. Uh, a lot of people have suggested when you count the people who have stopped looking, who have given up, the real unemployment rate might be closer to 9%. That's a lot of slack in the labor market that has to be absorbed before you get, before you get a lot of price pressure, especially wage inflation. Um, there's a lot of academic history that even when inflation ticks up, it tends to get in what's known as impounded into stock prices, which is to say that to the degree that companies can pass it along to their consumers, uh, it actually doesn't have a negative impact on the stock market. It tends to be absorbed and adjusted. 
Uh, and finally, uh, uh, Fair, Chairman uh, Jay Powell of the Fed is on the record multiple times in recent weeks saying, you know what, the Fed's not afraid of a little inflation. And that even if we do see a tick up in the near term, the Fed will not take preemptive action. That's one of the things you worry about if, if you're worried about the economy and the markets is that historically, when the Fed saw some inflation beginning to emerge, it would often clamp down on the economy. It would shrink the money supply, it would raise interest rates, and you'd go into a recession. Well, uh, Chairman Powell is saying, look, the Fed is prepared to accept a little inflation because we think, first of all, we think it'll be transient if it does appear. And we think that we've been, we've been in such a long period of low, really low inflation, that it's gonna be okay uh, if it runs above average for a while, that we're gonna look at a longer term average rate of inflation. We're not gonna target it on a month by month, quarter by quarter, year by year basis. So all of those things lead us to think that inflation is not the thing to be worrying about right now. Uh, but we're not, uh, um, but we're, you know, we're not ideologues. We, we will adjust and adapt over time. But we don't really, our outlook is that this is not a near-term problem. We may see a tick up. We don't think it'll have negative ramifications. Uh, and we certainly don't think the, the Fed is on record as saying they're not going to do anything damaging to the economy just because they see an uptick in inflation. And I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, Yusuf, but... Uh, oh, nothing further. Well, because we've run over and we've had some good questions along the way, I think we can uh, end by saying thank you very much for joining us. There will be a recording of this, of this webinar available. So uh, if you have any friends, family, or colleagues who you think might find it interesting, you will get a link and we hope you, sh you feel free to share that link. Uh, and if you have any follow-up questions for us on anything you've seen today or anything else, uh, just reach out. We, we, you know, we'd love to talk to you. Thanks.